Welcome to BrandonVot.com, where today I'm interviewing Colleen Carol Campbell. Colleen is an award-winning journalist, author, and a TV host. She is the anchor of EWTN's nightly newscast called EWTN News Nightly with uh, Colleen Carol Campbell, which is delivered straight from Capitol Hill. Colleen is the author or contributor to numerous books, including the much discussed 2002 book on young adults and religion titled The New Faithful, Why Young Adults Are Embracing Christian Orthodoxy. And her most recent book, and the one that we're going to be talking about right now, is called My Sisters the Saints. It was just released last October from Image Books and has been widely praised. It's a spiritual memoir in which uh, Colleen shares her own spiritual journey and weaves in the lives of several woman saints. Uh, but before we dive into that book, I want to welcome Colleen and, and say thank you, Colleen, for taking the time to chat. Welcome. Thanks for having me, Brandon. It's great to be with you. Now, in this book, My Sisters, the Saints, you look at six woman saints, including luminaries like St. Teresa of Avila, St. Therese of Lisieux, uh, St. Edith Stein, St. Faustina from Poland, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and uh, the saint that we're going to focus our chat today on, Blessed Teresa of Calcutta, more famously known as Mother Teresa. Now, first I'll ask a general question. What draws you to this diminutive Albanian nun? Well, uh, Brandon, like a lot of people who followed Mother Teresa through the years, she was, after all, a very photographed woman, even though she hated photographs. Uh, I think her prayer was that a soul would be released from purgatory every time she had to smile for the cameras. <laughs> so, certainly wouldn't have enjoyed a career in TV, but... Um, you know, I, I followed her work. I was always uh, impressed by her love of the poor and her uh, uncompromising devotion to Christ and to loving him in the poor. Um, but I think where I really began to connect with her on a more personal level, where she became more real to me, uh, was actually after her death, when I was going through a period in my life where I was struggling a lot uh, with with struggles that I chronicle in My Sisters the Saints, chiefly uh, a, a long struggle that my husband and I uh, were going through with infertility and also my father's long journey through Alzheimer's disease. And um, I was at a point where both of those trials were really sort of at their apex. And I was hitting a point in my faith where uh, all of the reading I had done, all the pious notions, uh, even on the prayer routines that I had leaned on before just weren't uh, they weren't really getting me through. I was really struggling and struggling with kind of those fundamental questions we all ask at one point or another. You know, why is God allowing this suffering to those I love, to me? Uh, is he still there? Is he still listening to me? Um, and, and so I was still obviously practicing my Catholic faith, still praying, still going to uh, Eucharistic adoration regularly. But all of the books that had pre previously inspired me kind of left me flat. And it was Mother Teresa's private spiritual writings that were released uh, around this same time. Um, Come Be My Light is the name of the book that uh, Father Brian Kolodechek edited uh, of these writings. They really spoke to me. And I, was, I had heard a little bit about how she had gone through sort of a spiritual dark night. But diving into those writings at the time that I did, I was amazed that this woman who seemed so beaming and joyful uh, and did so many wonderful things had also been enduring this really half-century spiritual darkness, as she described it. And uh, that gave me, A, a whole new appreciation for her, but it also drew me close to her and through her closer to Christ because I began to see uh, that I wasn't alone in some of these feelings of desolation I was having. I think the rest of the world was similarly surprised uh, when that book came out that uh, such a holy woman could experience such deep abandonment from God. She sensed uh, that the Lord wasn't there. She never felt His presence, uh, but she continued on. She persevered even amidst this so-called dark night. What lessons have you learned from this episode in Mother's Life? Well, it was interesting, um, you know, obviously in reading the book, and, and uh, it's very interesting to see that dark night, because I'd heard of this phenomenon, of course, uh, John of the Cross writes about it. One of my uh, other favorite saints, St. Saint Therese of Lisieux, who was Mother Teresa's 
uh, patron saint, and that's where she took her name and a lot of her spirituality, had gone through a sort of a dark night experience like this the last year and a half of her life. But Mother Teresa's was uh, unique both in its duration, some 50 years, uh, and also in the fact that uh, the theologians who sort of studied her writings and, and spiritual directors who, who spoke to her, at least one in particular, uh, Father Neuner, who really had some insights that helped her, saw it not as a darkness meant to purify her, but as a darkness she experienced almost in reparation, a reparative darkness, I guess you could say, an apostolic darkness. A darkness, in other words, that was her way of sharing Christ's suffering on the cross and in a certain sense, suffering for those souls who were indifferent to Christ. Um, so again, I wasn't going through anything like this. I'm <laughs> nowhere near Mother Teresa's level in terms of uh, holiness or anything else. Uh, so I don't claim I was going through a dark night of the soul. But it, what it helped me do uh, was understand that, um, first of all, uh, and maybe most importantly, God is right there, even in our darkest moments, sometimes especially in our darkest moments. And often the key to faith in those moments is doing what Mother Teresa did so well. And that is just one foot in front of the other every day, waking up and choosing to do God's will, even if you don't feel like it. And uh, in so many ways, that's an important lesson for anyone in any walk of life. And for me at that time, especially with the trials I was dealing with, uh, it just really gave me the sense that, uh, again, I wasn't alone in this and that maybe I was going somewhere even though I felt spiritually stuck. Now, one of the poignant narratives that weaves its way throughout your entire book is your father's struggle with dementia and your own uh, struggles caring for him in the midst of it. We live in a throwaway culture that would look at somebody like your father and say, you know, he's not really there. He can't really produce much. He's basically gone already. And so we, you know, we should just let him go. We should just kind of subtly shift him to the margins. Uh, what do you think Mother Teresa would say to this sort of culture where your value is tied to your productivity? Well, she spoke very powerfully, of course, to our culture on those very topics. Uh, you know, she was uncompromisingly pro-life and not just focusing on the unborn, but also those, as you described at the margins of life, the elderly, uh, the demented, uh, the frail, uh, the handicapped. And um, again, here you can see reflections in her spirituality of the spirituality of Therese of Lisieux and her little way. And Therese's little way had really helped me uh, make sense of my father's dementia along the way. And Mother Teresa and her writings, an example, really built on that for me uh, in the sense that, that she always talked about the privilege it was to encounter Christ in the poor and in the weak and in those the world considers disposable. Uh, and, and so she didn't think of herself as doing good deeds for them. She saw herself as having this immense privilege that I get to touch the hands and feet of Christ. Every time I bathe a leper, every time I um, uh, serve someone who's dying and going to die anyway, no matter what I do, every time I hold a child who, whom someone has rejected for not having the attributes of a productive citizen. Um, so she really lived that with all her being. And, and in a sense, she turns the world upside down in the way that she looks at the world, which I think a good Christian uh, should have a worldview that, that looks a little upside down to our, our very secular, productivity-oriented culture. Um, and when I began to look at things from that perspective, and again, that began when I discovered St. Therese of Lisieux in my early 20s, but it intensified the more I got to know these other saints, and especially Blessed Mother Teresa uh, of Calcutta, you know, you begin to see someone, and I began to see in my father just glimmers of grace, hints of some process of, of spiritual purification and growth in him that you couldn't see immediately. But if you began to watch him, his increase in charity, in peace, the way that I felt around him, it was almost like uh, the way I would feel walking into the chapel, uh, the Eucharistic Adoration Chapel. Sometimes just walking into my father's presence was a similar feeling of peace and transcendence and uh, total love. And that really built over the years. You know, he, he was always a man who was uh, sincere in his convictions and profound in his faith. But I watched a lot of this difficulty of dementia purify him even more, make him more childlike in his faith, and for me, made him a real... Uh, 
beacon, especially as I was struggling uh, with my own trials, especially in fertility, to be able to look at him, someone who was struggling so much, and see that joy and peace and realize that God was working there in and through his cross, which is precisely how God worked in Mother Teresa's life, in and through the cross that she carried interiorly for 50 years. Beautiful. Now, one of, the, one of the things I've long admired about your work is your courageous advocacy for the so-called new feminism encouraged by Blessed Pope John Paul II. What lessons would you say Mother Teresa has taught you about true femininity and authentic womanhood? Well, there aren't too many better examples than Mother Teresa of spiritual maternity, which is really what uh, our late blessed Pope John Paul II described as kind of the core attribute, uh, both of this, this sort of new feminism he called for, but more broadly speaking, uh, the feminine nature. And of course, uh, one of my other favorite saints that I talk about a lot in My Sisters the Saints is St. Edith Stein. She wrote a lot about this idea of spiritual maternity. Um, and for me, that was very meaningful at a time that I was dealing with infertility, um, not sure I'd ever bear biological children, and sort of caught in a culture that at one point treats children like a choice. You, you perhaps, if you're smart, should reject. And at the, on the other hand, uh, if you don't have them and you've been married a certain number of years, you're, you're made to feel sort of uh, like what's wrong with you, especially um, sometimes even in religious circles where there's a sense that you must be rejecting children when sometimes people just don't know the full story. You very much long for children. So in the midst of all of that, this idea of spiritual maternity, that I had the capacity to be a mother right now where I was simply by virtue of being a woman, whether or not I would ever bear biological children. Um, you know, Edith Stein was the one who really advanced that idea and modeled it. But I would say that Blessed Mother of Teresa of Calcutta really uh, brought that to life even in a new way as I uh, applied that idea and looked at a life like hers where, I mean, this woman never married, never bore biological children, uh, and yet, you know, her spiritual progeny stretched to the ends of the earth. If you think of the people who've been touched by her, and not just physically touched, caring for the sick and the poor and feeding the hungry, taking in orphans, advocating for the unborn, but also those who were touched by her spiritually, by her writings, by her example. She really nurtured that spark of divine life in the soul. That's Edith Stein's phrase. But I think Blessed Mother Teresa really brought that phrase to life in a modern context that we could see, uh, thanks in part to all those photographs she couldn't stand. And so uh, for me, that really resonated. And when I think of the new feminism and when I think of uh, what it means to be a woman in the most fundamental sense from a Christian point of view. I think that spiritual maternity is really central. And I think the key is we're always tempted to define that too narrowly. And God has made all sorts of women in all walks of life with all different talents and capacities. And that's the great thing about the new feminism. Uh, we can embrace all of those women and all of their diverse gifts uh, but the thing I think that really brings us together and unites us as women is this innate gift of spiritual maternity that we can choose to identify and recognize and foster and then give to others, which after all, giving our lives away is the core of who we are, not just as women, but as Christians. One thing that immediately leaps out from your great book, My Sisters the Saints, is your closeness to the saints. Uh, it's not a dry biography looking at the saints from a distance, uh, but these women had become very close to you. They became your friends. Uh, as Catholics, we believe that saints are not just dead heroes to emulate, but friends and allies to connect with today. Uh, what advice would you have for people who want to become friends with the saints? How do you befriend a saint? Well, it's funny, Brandon, um, and I say this uh, a bit in the uh, intro to the book. This this isn't a group of women I expected to become my friends or spiritual sisters. I was raised in a, a very devout Catholic home, and books by and about the saints were all over the shelves, uh, that kind of home in many senses that my own children are being raised in. Uh, but for me, the saints still seem sort of remote and a little bit goody-two-shoes, and that sense really grew when I was in uh, college, where they just seemed so far away from any concerns that I could possibly have at that point. Um, so they weren't the first ones I looked to, especially as I was seeking uh, to be liberated, to understand what does it mean to be a liberated woman, what does it mean to realize my dreams 
Um, and, and in many ways, I was looking to the world, especially during my college years, you know, trying to fulfill a certain ideal uh, career wise, looks wise, you know, uh, socially speaking, in romantic ways, in every way, trying to sort of live up to something that uh, the more I came close to achieving it, the more I realized it was empty, it was ephemeral, it wasn't really, there wasn't much to it. Um, and then I took a secular feminist philosophy course, and I thought maybe there was, you know, something I could sink my teeth into there, and there were some uh, parts of that that resonated with me. But in the end, it was very materialistic, and frankly, just kind of dull and drab, and how do we get the power away from men who have power, and you know. I was just finding myself a little bit at a dead end, and that's where the journey in my sisters, the saints, really began. Uh, as I chronicle in the in the first chapter, is is at that point where I had sort of tried everything else, um, and it was first Saint Teresa of Avila, and then a series of the other saints, some of whom we've talked about, who showed me that you can be a liberated woman, you can um, embrace your talents and gifts, you can. You can, you know, do interesting things in public life. You can embrace your femininity as well. And you can do all of this um, in and through your Christian faith. In fact, at the end of the day, it's Jesus Christ who's the true liberator of women. And that's something I discovered through the saints. So I didn't set out so much to have a certain kind of relationship with them so much as uh, one by one at crucial times in my life when dealing with very specific struggles that I chronicle in the book, uh, one of these saints would sort of emerge. I would just keep running into this book. Somebody would just keep mentioning a saint to me. Uh, I would just keep stumbling on some writing until finally I'd sink my teeth into one of their works because uh, uh, most of these women wrote, wrote beautiful books and uh, resonate. And I would realize that for all the time that separated us and all the circumstances, uh, these women, uh, whether you know, we're talking uh, Mary of Nazareth or someone as more modern like Blessed Teresa of Calcutta. These women had asked the same fundamental questions I was asking in a different context. And the answers they had found were the satisfying ones, the ones that last. And that's how I became friends with them. And, and I really feel at the end of the day, and I've been told this so much by readers who've given me feedback on, on my sisters, the saints, that the saints that we need find us more than we really find them. And I know that's been true in my life. Excellent advice. Well, again, Colleen, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to chat. I really appreciate it. Uh, where can people go to find out more about you and your work online? Sure, uh, they can go to my website, www.colleen-campbell.com. Colleen-campbell.com and they can um, see more about My Sisters and Saints, read a sample chapter there. Uh, they can also learn more about the new newscast, EWTN News Nightly, and uh, and anything else they want to know. It's pretty much there on Colleen-Campbell.com. Excellent. And I encourage everybody to uh, check out her new book, My Sisters, the Saints, uh, which, again, I, has been highly endorsed and acclaimed everywhere I look. It's a fantastic book, and so I definitely recommend it. And for more interviews, articles, book reviews, and more, check out my website, which is brandonvot.com. Thanks for tuning in.